Uh, hello and welcome to this uh, third part of physically unclonable functions. Uh, this is part of the NPTEL course Secure Systems Engineering. So, in the previous two video lectures, uh, we had an introduction to uh, physically unclonable functions and uh, we seen that it is uh, essentially a technique, uh, a digital fingerprinting technique uh, that is used uh, to achieve things like authentication without using uh, secret keys stored in a device. We seen that each puff uh, needs to have a good intra and interchip uh, variations for it to be actually useful for uh, uh, cryptographic pur purposes like uh, authentication. Uh, in this uh, lecture, we will be looking at the use of uh, puffs to provide authentication. So, the uh, thing what we will actually be looking at is a uh, setup where uh, we have a server over here and uh, we have an edge device and this edge device has a physically un unclonable function that is a puff uh, present in it. So, uh, the problem that we are actually trying to solve here is that uh, how would the server authenticate this particular device using the puff. Uh, so, the way to go about it is that at the time of manufacture of this puff, the uh, manufacturer would create a database for challenges and the corresponding responses. So, uh, this database over here uh, is known as the CRP database and it would be stored in the server. So, the CRP database contains a challenge and the expected response from this particular device. Now, when this uh, edge device is fielded and it is actually used uh, in, uh, in, a in, in some application, uh, at some time or the other the server would require that this device needs to be authenticated. Uh, when such authentication is required, the uh, server would uh, pick up a challenge uh, from the CRP table and send this particular challenge uh, to this edge device. Uh, the edge device would then use this challenge in its puff and obtain the corresponding response. So, that response is sent back to the server. So, note that since we are assuming that there is no cryptography present, uh, there is no encryption or decryption or any other stored keys present in the edge device. Uh, therefore, the challenge and the response would be uh, sent in clear text. Now, uh, once the server uh, obtains the response from the edge device, uh, it would look up the CRP database that it has stored and uh, it would compare the CRP, uh, uh, the response stored in the database with the response obtained from the edge device. Uh, essentially, it would look at the Hamming distance uh, between the two and uh, determine whether uh, this response has actually originated from this specific uh, device. So, in this way, uh, the uh, edge device will be authenticated. Now, uh, for, for instance, let us say that um, uh, there is another rogue device that is present here and uh, which is trying to masquerade as the original edge ed device. Now, when the server sends a challenge, uh, the properties of the puff uh, would make it difficult to predict what the response would be. Further, even if a puff is implemented in this rogue device, the response will look quite different than uh, what the original response was from the, uh, the correct edge device. Therefore, when the response goes back to the server, uh, the server would be able to identify that uh, this response does not match um, the response stored in the database and therefore, it would uh, reject the device or it would uh, uh, say that the authentication is not, not successful. So, one aspect that is an issue with puff based authentication techniques is the uh, case of the man in the middle. So, note that we said uh, that uh, the challenge and the response is sent in clear text and therefore, uh, any man in the middle could view the challenge and the corresponding response. Now, if the server actually sends the same challenge again, uh, the man in the middle, the attacker would be able to actually respond to that corresponding challenge. Uh, without actually forwarding the challenge to the uh, device. So, in order to prevent this uh, man in the middle attacks uh, on puffs, uh, what is required is that uh, the CRP once used should not be reused again, which means that uh, 
once the server actually uses a challenge and obtains a corresponding response, <coughs> that particular entry should be marked as deactivated or uh, removed from this uh, CRP database and never used again. So, this way the man in the middle attacks can be prevented to a far extent. One negative aspect of having the man in the middle uh, uh, attack and actually preventing the reuse of CRPs uh, is the fact that uh, the size of this CRP database should be extensively large. The reason for this is that the uh, CRP tables are generally created at the time of manufacture or uh, before the device is uh, fielded. So, th therefore, uh, for the entire lifetime of this uh, particular edge device, we should have sufficient amount of challenge and corresponding responses stored in the server. So, that uh, periodic authentication is supported um, for the entire life. For example, let us say that uh, we have this edge device which is uh, say put in a, a remote uh, power plant and uh, this edge device is expected to be used for say let us say 3 years. Further, we assume that every day uh, there should be a challenge and response sent from the server uh, to this edge device uh, so as to authenticate the edge device. Uh, this would mean that the CRP database should have uh, over 1000 different challenge and response corresponding to this single uh, edge device. So, uh, the periodicity of the authentication could vary from application to application. Uh, it could be much smaller than authenticating a single day. Uh, so, there could be applications where you require authentication every say 45 minutes or so and therefore, you would end up with very large CRP tables. Further, what we also see is that each CRP table is de uh, device specific and this is true because each CRP corresponds uh, to the unique uh, challenge and responses corresponding to e each device. Therefore, uh, now things get uh, uh, much more worse because uh, if we have uh, multiple devices uh, which are uh, managed by a single server, there would be uh, multiple such CRP tables that are required to be stored in the server database. Other aspects that could be uh, an issue is that um, these CRP tables if they are stolen or uh, if the privacy of the uh, server gets breached, then the entire uh, security of the puffs um, corresponding to these devices would be uh, lost. So, researchers have been trying several alternate techniques where they could uh, either reduce the size of the CRP tables or uh, alternatively uh, try to eliminate the use of CRP tables uh, in the authentication process when puffs are used. So, one very popular model is uh, something known as the secret model of puff. So, what happens over here is uh, at the time of manufacture, uh, instead of uh, querying the device with different challenges, obtaining the responses and storing the challenge response pairs uh, in a database, what happens in a secret model puff is that the manufacturer would study the properties of this puff and create a model for that particular puff. For example, uh, the server could build a database of uh, the various gate delays that are present uh, in this arbiter puff and it would actually require to store uh, this uh, model for this specific arbiter puff. So, what this model would actually be capable of doing is that uh, given a particular challenge, uh, this particular model could create a very good estimate of what the response for a particular puff uh, should be for that specific uh, challenge. So, what is required is that this uh, model for the puff is kept secret and when the device is actually fielded um, and when authentic authentication is required, the server would randomly choose a particular challenge. It would uh, use this model of uh, this particular puff to uh, create what is the expected response for that particular challenge. It would then send out the challenge to this device and obtain the response. It would then compare this response to what is the expected response obtained from the model. A close match between the expected response and the actual response obtained uh, from the device for that particular challenge would then be used uh, to authenticate the device. Now, uh, this uh, works quite well, uh, especially on uh, puffs which can be actually modeled in such a way where uh, the secret model of this puff can be extracted at uh, the manufacture time. But uh, nevertheless, this 
technique still has a limitation. The limitation is that uh, this puff uh, model still has to be kept secret and it has to be extremely secret because if this model is lost then any attacker could snoop into the challenge uh, uh, that is sent from the server to the edge device, uh, use that model which it has just stolen and provide the response for uh, that particular challenge. In this way the attacker machine can get authenticated without actually having a puff. So, there have been other works uh, such as the public model puff uh, which have been uh, researched. So, uh, this public model puff works in a very similar way. So, uh, except for the fact that the model for the puff which is developed using the various gate delays and uh, stored in the data database present in the server does not have to be secret. So, the uh, fact that is actually used over here is, is that if for a particular challenge uh, that is sent to the actual device that owns uh, the right puff, obtaining the, obtaining the response will just take a few nanoseconds. Uh, therefore, if uh, a challenge is sent to the, to the device which, which actually has the puff, uh, the server would obtain the uh, response very quickly. On the other hand, if there is an attacker who actually has a copy of this particular model of the uh, puff, sending the challenge and uh, computing the model based on this public model would take quite some time uh, even with heavy computing resources. Therefore, the delay between the sending the challenge and obtaining the response from a attacker device uh, would be considerable. Therefore, in this form of auth authentication what is suggested is that uh, the attacker picks out a random challenge, uses this public model for the puff to obtain what an expected response for that particular challenge and then sends out the challenge to the device. It also notes the, the time taken for the response to be obtained. Now, if the time taken is greater than uh, some particular threshold in this case T naught, uh, then uh, it is assumed that the response is obtained from a malicious device or from an attacker device and uh, uh, is ignored and uh, no authentication is done. On the other hand, if uh, the time to obtain the response is very short, much lesser than the threshold, then the server would uh, validate the response with the expected response obtained uh, from this uh, model of the puff and if the match is quite close to this to the expected response, then the device would get authenticated. While uh, this particular technique assumes that uh, other factors like network delays and uh, routing delays and so on are uh, not considered, this technique would work quite well for uh, small systems uh, with uh, small local networks. Another technique which uh, where there is a considerable amount of research uh, going on is to use uh, something known as homomorphic encryption. Uh, using this, the challenge and response pairs which is generated uh, for this particular puff present in the device is encrypted and stored in an untrusted environment. Now, the basic property of using homomorphic encryption is the fact that the validation of a particular response can be done on encrypted data. This means that uh, the server could actually run a particular program in this untrusted cloud which works on the encrypted CRP database and would be able to actually obtain whether uh, the response is in fact valid or not valid even without decrypting the CRP database. So, uh, in this particular model uh, as usual the server would actually send the particular challenge uh, to this edge device, uh, obtain the corresponding response which if valid is obtained from the puff and this uh, response is then sent to the uh, untrusted uh, environment, this could be a, a regular cloud uh, computing environment. The homomorphic uh, encryption technique used present in this untrusted uh, environment then works on this encrypted database and validates whether the response is indeed uh, the response which is stored in the database. In this way, even though this uh, cloud is untrusted, uh, the security of the database uh, is ensured uh, because of the homomorphic encryption present. Now, uh, while uh, this seems like a, a very good solution for solving the CRP problem uh, in puffs, there are uh, still a lot of research before actually taking this homomorphic encryption uh, to practice, practice. The reason being that uh, it takes still considerable amount of time to actually validate 
uh, encrypted responses using an encrypted database. Although a lot of uh, research is actually taking place in order to reduce this uh, time requirements. To conclude this video lecture on PUFFs, uh, PUFFs are an extremely uh, useful uh, technique or mechanism uh, to achieve uh, various cryptographic things like uh, authentication, uh, secret key generation and so on and uh, with a very small fingerprint and also it is ensured that if a puff is present in a device then that particular device cannot be cloned. There is a lot of uh, research which is going on to find actually new puffs uh, such as analog puffs, uh, puffs using sensors and so on. There is still a huge problem of uh, solving the CRP issue and how uh, the CRP tables could be actually compressed so that the efficiency and the memory storage can be reduced. One of the major drawbacks of actually uh, of puffs which is preventing it uh, quite a bit from actually going to commodity devices uh, is these attacks known as model building attacks. So, within a mo model building attack uh, what happens is that um, you could consider a scenario where you have a server and a device and uh, uh, this device has a puff and the server over a period of time is uh, sending challenges and obtaining response. Uh, now, there is also a passive listener uh, in this entire thing who uh, views the challenges and, uh, and the responses and over a period of time uses machine learning techniques or model building uh, techniques uh, to build a model of that puff. Now, after a certain number of uh, authentications have completed uh, for a given challenge the attacker could use the model for that puff which it has actually created uh, which it has actually built and respond to the challenge. Thus you see that uh, authentication would break in this way because the atta attacker without actually owning the correct puff uh, would be able to provide the right responses for uh, challenges. Another big problem with puffs is uh, that of tampering uh, with the puff computation. For example, during a puff computation if uh, for instance uh, an attacker has is able to actually get hold of that device and manipulate the device operation by say forcing a sinusoidal wave uh, in the power or the ground plane, then the response from the puff uh, would can be altered. So, if the puff response is altered beyond a particular degree. Uh, the, the authentication would fail because the server would find a large amount of mismatch with uh, the response which is stored, stored in the CRP table and the response obtained by the puff hardware. Uh, this would be more like a denial of service attack where uh, the attacker rather than learning what the response would be is essentially preventing the device from getting authenticated. Nevertheless, uh, puffs are a very promising uh, way for uh, lightweight authentication of uh, edge devices and uh, perhaps in the near future we would actually see a lot of puffs being used uh, in these devices and uh, this would ensure that the, the devices will not get cloned, uh, no secret key is uh, required in the device and so on. Thank you.